The stories are queued up and ready to roll. It's time for another edition of Hatterberg's People. And here's a look at what is coming up. I, I cried every day. You know, I, there was no happiness in my life. Uh, I, I, it was like I was wandering around looking for an answer, but I couldn't find one. Abused as a child and scarred for life, Sean Huff was an overcomer. He achieved national acclaim back in the 1990s. Hear how his tragic story, though, turned inspiring and find out where he is now, also. A lot of people don't even know what a slide projector is. Nowadays, you look at your pictures on the computer. But in 2008, there was still one place in the world where you could get your Kodak film developed, and it was right here in Kansas. Larry paid a visit to see why this old-fashioned technology continued to generate good business for a small-town company. Plus... I think it's a validation for me personally of, of, the, of the journey uh, that I took as an artist, and it's, it's, it is a huge gamble, and, and it's... it's filled with both incredible excitement and great lows. He is a one-of-a-kind Kansas artist who has gotten a lot of attention through the years, and in 2008, that included a feature film about his life. We'll go on location in Lawrence and visit with the one and only Stan Hurd. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Larry Hatterberg. And I'm Susan Peters. Those are just some of Larry's classic stories we will rewind and revisit on this edition of Hatterberg's People. These stories are like old friends. Their lives radiate from the screen like prophets of the past. They were teachers, but not in a classroom. Instead, they taught about life to those around them who cared to listen, and I was their student. Life's journey has many twists and turns and ups and downs. And for the man in our first story, the ride has been especially bumpy and chaotic. But it has also had some great successes. The man's name is Sean Huff. And for him, life has been a nonstop journey of highs and lows, striving to heal from a horrific childhood. I, I cried every day. You know, I, there was no happiness in my life. Uh, I, I, it was like I was wandering around looking for an answer, but I couldn't find one. Sean Huff is a survivor. The first seven years of his life, he was physically and emotionally abused. It took 30 operations to correct the physical abuse. It was hard, I'm not going to lie. Today, Sean is a student at Sterling College in Sterling, Kansas. He's an articulate student and outstanding athlete who wants to help others who are victims of life's abuses. I got beatings that most, with things that most children don't get beat with, uh, as for instance, uh, uh, barber straps. Come on, you got Today, you'd never know Sean had lived the first seven years of his life out of a suitcase, being shuffled from foster home to foster home. Then, he was placed with a special family, the Huffs. I think the love of my parents and, and uh, the love of other people that have helped me get to where I am today. They loved him without condition, sent him to a Christian high school where he excelled in sports. But early in his school career, he was a teacher's nightmare. I swore. I threw desks at teachers. I tried to stab teachers. I, uh, I, had, I was so angry inside. But today in class, it is a far different Sean that inhabits the halls of learning. He credits good and patient teachers for part of his turnaround. I spent many hours in timeout room, the teacher just holding me in his arms saying, Sean, I love you. And I'm crying and kicking and saying I hate you. But I think those times were building bridges. They were knocking down the walls in my life. Sean's young life has been days of strengthening, surrounded by teachers who didn't give up on him. And with a religious conversion, he says, changed his life. He has a message for other young people who may be in trouble. There was an old saying that I, my coach told me, and he, he said, if you, if you aim at nothing, you're bound to hit it. And I always remember that, you know. And I, I tell these kids out there, you know, ain't, have a goal. You know, don't set them so unrealistic you can't achieve them. Don't set, don't set your goals to, to win awards or anything like that, because that'll come. You set your goals on firm foundations on what you want to do with your life and keeping the Lord first and all those other things will come. Sean has been honored nationally as being one of those special young people who's conquered adversity, but fame isn't that important to him. In the future, 
He hopes to help other kids who just need someone to love them. Show those kids that there's more to life than, than partying, than drugs, than, you know, doing what you want to do all the time. That there's a whole other side of life. And if you discover that side of life, it'll be there for, for eternity. After being recognized by President George H.W. Bush as one of the thousand points of light, Sean graduated on the Dean's List from Sterling in 1995. Since then, though, his life has been a mix of good and bad. Sean got married, had a son, and a good job. Then life started to unravel. Tissue damage behind the socket made it no longer possible for Sean to wear a prosthetic eye. The scars from his childhood continued to cause emotional struggles. His marriage ended and in 2011, Sean found himself homeless on the streets of Colorado Springs. But a year later, with the help of friends, he got back on his feet. My hope is one day that um, this, this story will be told and the people that stood up in my life, that their, their stories will be told. That, that really is one of my motivations. I, I, I think that this is so powerful in terms of the people that came in my life when they didn't have to invest in me. Uh, they had no rhyme or reason to write a check or to give a hug or to show compassion, but they did. And they did it over and over and over again. And I can honestly say that I'm alive having this interview because of those people today. Sean is now 49 years old, lives in Phoenix, and has joint custody of his son, who is 16, and a star football player, Sean's pride and joy. Now, while the challenges never end, Sean says life is good once again. I like stories with happy endings, I, and this I, one is I do one. I too, and you know, life sometimes doesn't have good in it. Mm. Sometimes we go through horrific things, and yep. no one's immune. No. We, we all go through our bad things in life, and it's just how we come out of it. Life is a winding path, not a straight line. There, I like that line. We can keep that. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. Now a story about the decline of Kodachrome film, the world's most commercially successful color film ever, and how Kansas factored into the story. In 2008, Larry talked with the man who owned the last Kodachrome processing machine in the world and it was right here in Kansas. I also talked with a photographer who understood the important role that film played in our history. There it is, a roll of Kodachrome film. Now all of us took pictures with it beginning in 1935, but now it could become extinct. Gary Brownlee, the president of the Wichita Camera Club, laments the decline of the film days. Holding these old Kodachrome slides to the light to sort is a day gone by as digital photography takes over. A lot of people don't even know what a slide projector is. Nowadays, you look at your pictures on the computer. The Eastman Kodak Company sold Kodachrome film worldwide. With processing labs all over the world, slides like these of my mother from the 1950s are still as vivid as the day they were shot. Kodachrome was manufactured differently than all other color films. In Parsons, Kansas, Dwayne's is the last photo lab in the world to process Kodachrome film. Brett Steinler is the owner. As Kodak decided they wanted to consolidate their facilities around the world, it just ended up being more economical for them to subcontract to us, and so we ended up being the last lab in the world. This is the last Kodachrome film processing machine left anywhere right here in Kansas. Dwayne's receives Kodachrome worldwide from these diehard fans who love the incredible color and the archival storage ability of this once popular film. We're probably doing over a thousand rolls of Kodachrome every day. Gary Brownlee still has an old slide projector and probably like your dad used to pull the shades, put up the screen and then in vivid color those Kodachrome slides would make us laugh or cry even bring back those old memories of shared trips and stories. There will be a certain element that will miss it. Uh, the artists will miss it. Uh, some of your niche professionals will miss it. The consumers probably won't. 
you know, it's kind of exciting to be the last Kodachrome lab out there. It's interesting to look at the images, see what people are still taking on Kodachrome film. Professionally, Kodachrome was used by many of the world's great photographers. For example, who could forget this great picture of an Afghan girl taken by photographer Steve McCurry of National Geographic. And there have been so many iconic images through the years captured on Kodachrome film. Kodachrome was the first color film invented by Eastman Kodak Company. Yeah. This is the last Kodachrome processor running in the world today. But as the old days fade into history, for many photographers, if Kodachrome goes away, it's not just the end of a brand of film, it is the end of a photographic era. It just doesn't seem like that's right. Now that photo lab continued processing Kodak film from around the world for another two years. Then Kodak pulled the plug and stopped making Kodachrome altogether. Two. I th just think it was a sad, sad day. Kodachrome was a great, great film. You know. Yeah, you and everybody work with it used all the Kodachrome. Time. And you could always tell somebody had used Kodachrome because the colors were so vivid. Mm -hmm. They were just so beautiful and bright. And everybody shot Kodachrome on their color slides. They, yeah. Yeah, and you know, you put the slides up on the screen anyway. back in the day of slides. Uh, yeah. And they were wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Not only that, okay, if you haven't seen it, you got to go to Netflix and watch this documentary. It's kind of a docudrama about when the lab closed right. in 2010. Right. And people from all over the world came to Parsons, Kansas, drove, flew, whatever, to be to get their Kodachrome film developed. It's a, it's a, it's a great show. Kodachrome is like us, just a part of history now. Oh, Larry, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Instead of film and a camera, the man in our next story captures images with farmland and a tractor. Yeah, he sure does. He is a well-known Kansas artist, and his name is Stan Hurd. Now, you've seen other stories I've done about him, but this one is about a movie being shot about Stan's life. It was 2008. Uh, hold that. So we're going to start with you watering the last plant here. Let me know when you're set. No grab. Scene 93, take three, marker. Action. The cameras are rolling in Lawrence this month, and this man is the reason why. Stan Hurd is a Kansas artist whose work has been seen internationally for almost 30 years. If you went down the streets of New York City and asked 100 people who Stan Hurd is, uh, you, nobody would say, oh, he's that artist. If you showed him my, my work, I think a lot of people would say, yes, I've seen, I've seen that work. This is the kind of work Stan has done all over the world. These, though, are some of his Kansas landscapes. But it was a piece he did in New York where Heard befriended homeless people that is the subject of the movie. Chris Ordahl is the writer-producer of Earthwork. The story about an artist who pretty much risks everything, uh, his family, his financial security, his credibility, because he's passionate about something that he believes in his heart. Playing a younger Stan Hurd is actor John Hawks. Now you recognize his face from The Perfect Storm, Deadwood, and American Gangster. Stan's a fascinating character in so many ways. Uh, you can begin with his art, which is uh, just phenomenal. I've never seen anything like it. All right, let's go. As the cameras roll on the movie set, in real life, Stan Hurd has paid the price for his passionate art. Part of the movie is about how working in New York helped destroy his marriage. Since then, Stan's outlook is more focused. I'm very tuned in to wanting to simplify my life as much as possible so I have the freedom to, to travel, spend time with the people I love, and, uh, you know, make art. Let me know when you're set. I think it's a validation for me personally of, of, the, of the journey uh, that I took as an artist. And, it's it's it is a huge gamble and and it's it's filled with both incredible excitement and great lows. Seven years ago, I wanted to leave Kansas because uh, I, it was just too much of a struggle financially. And uh, there's still a bit of that, but uh, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Good. Perfect. It was perfect. I never ever have measured success by things. It's just freedom. Now I think I'm prepared to to do my best work. Now that movie came out in 2009 and won awards at more than 50 film festivals across the country. The title is, as you might imagine, Earthwork, 
and you can stream it online. Meanwhile, one of Stan's latest art projects is this portrait of the late civil rights leader and congressman, John Lewis. He was commissioned to create this in a park in Atlanta, Georgia, by contouring the soil and using other organic materials. In 2020, Heard created these portraits of then candidates Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in a field near Lawrence. I have done so many stories on Stan, and I, I still to this day do not understand how he makes those acreage pictures, how those huge mile by mile square pictures. It's just unbelievable. Wouldn't you have to be a great engineer or, or uh, architect to draw it all out? And I, then... I would think so. I think he just sees this yeah. stuff. And, and then is able to draw it. Great, great talent. Mm -hmm. Emotional support animals have become a popular thing in recent years, but the idea isn't anything new. Now, back in 1986, a furry little visitor showed up one day at a Wichita nursing home, and that seemed to make life just a little bit better there. <laughs> Meet Doc a four-legged prescription for happiness. That's what the folks at the Christ Villa Nursing Center in West Wichita believe. Come here, come on. Oh, that's a good kiss. Doc just showed up one day several weeks ago, and since then, the Two place hasn't been the same. Two little eyes and go to sleep. Oh, I know. A pain in the neck, but what can we do? Avis Llewellyn spends hours with Doc, and their time together is very special. I can sit down and don't be too mentally, be right in my lap. They know who loves them and who don't. An animal is so delightful to people anyway, I think. Maxine Ackerman's husband is here at Christ Villa, so she's come to know many of the residents personally. The dog, she says, has made a difference. They seem so much happier, and the smiles are just so rewarding. <laughs> you can relate to an animal sometimes better than you can relate to another person. Cheryl Ray is the activities director. She says that this doc is sometimes better than human ones. Doc won't give you advice. Um, he won't tell you no, he won't tell you you have to go take a shower, he won't t tell you you have to take your medicine. You can just tell Doc everything and she'll sit there and she'll understand and she'll give you a hug and a kiss. I know you're tired, sweetheart. This is not a story that will alter human history, but it is a moment in time where a small dog made a difference, a difference in someone's life. This is Laurie Hatterberg. We tried to follow up and had no luck finding out how long Doc stayed at the nursing home. That was 1986. Obviously, he and all the residents from that time are long gone, but not forgotten because of Hatterberg's people. We have the video. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the nursing home residents loved the animal. Oh. Just, it just would come in and just make their lives better. And if you can make someone's life better just for a few minutes, it's Just for a it. few minutes. It's all right. And dogs and cats can do wonders. They can. For a I, person's mood. I have a cat does wonders for my mood. And I have <laughs> Luigi, my dog, dog who does yeah. wonders for my mood. See there? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go to Council Grove. <laughs> Shirley McClintock is credited with saving an old home that nobody else thought was worth it. It is a home that parallels Kansas's statehood. Here's Larry's story from 2008. It represents people, it represents struggle, it represents pain, it represents beauty. It sits on the old Santa Fe Trail, now 56 Highway, on the west edge of Council Grove. I wanted this place to be a place along the Santa Fe Trail where people could feel heart and warmth and a, a respite from their travels uh, along life's road. In 1994, the home faced demolition because of its dilapidated condition, but Shirley McClintock couldn't bear to let that happen. We should be about the business of saving, preserving, not destroying. It's part of ourselves. It's who we are. 
and we lose part of ourselves when we don't treasure it. The front part of the home was built in 1860 when Kansas was a territory. Over the years, it's seen many other forms from that of a home to a gas station. Now restored, it is home to the Trail Days Bakery Cafe. If we could just get enough sleep, we'd be okay, but it just takes so much um, uh, work. She talked her husband Ken into helping with the renovation, and now together they work to make the cafe a Kansas showplace. We enjoy it because uh, you have an opportunity to meet people from all over the world. The house was built in 1860 by a frontier family, but it takes its name from its second owners, the Terwilliger family. Now this was the last house covered wagons passed going west as late as 1863. The McClinics have attempted to keep it furnished in the ways of the 1800s. And so by the time this house was completely finished, Kansas had become a state, had gone from territory to state. So the birth of this house is the birth of the state of Kansas. Etched into the side of the doorway is a rare find. It's an authentic Indian pictograph from either the Kansa or the Osage Indians. It's unbelievable. This place requires a tremendous uh, sacrifice on our part to keep it going. Sometimes we're really tired and we spend a lot of long hours here. But the joys here, are the people who come. I honestly believe that it, I was divinely led to do it, that this is God's plan, and I'm just the one he has chosen to carry out my little corner of doing something to stop the destruction. We're a little old to be doing this, but, but it's a work of the heart. Shirley is still at it and says the restaurant has been a big success. The nonprofit Trail Days Cafe and Museum has won numerous travel awards. Restoration efforts have spread to other buildings on the property, and Shirley and the volunteer staff stay busy hosting guests and tour groups. And if people are looking for a short trip in Kansas, this is the place to go. How, how long does it take to get there from not, here? Not long. No? No. Good. Not All right. Easy. I'm there. Rural Kansas is a big place full of small pleasures. And one of those little pleasures is a place called Elm Falls. It's near the Chisholm Trail south of Carleton, Kansas. And that's where I found Virgil Mayer. No matter what the man-made turmoil is in Washington, on the prairie and in the Kansas hills, there is no urgency. Over those hills, you can see the elevator in Carleton, Kansas. Downtown there, they don't take themselves too seriously. Here, life has its own pace. And folks who live in the area south of Abilene know that only the land is forever. Virgil Meyer loves this land. For all of his 90 years, it has been his life. Oh, I like to show it to people like you. About 80 years ago, before they had all the parks and things, why a lot of folks come down here on Sunday. There are little places in Kansas that few know. And this is one of them. Just a pretty place, and used to come down here and take a bath when I was a little kid in grade school. It's called Elm Falls, and locals say it is along the Chisholm Trail where covered wagons might have stopped. And a lot of harvest hands, they'd come down here and take a bath after they got through thrashing. It was kind of cold. Nearly impossible to find, it is on a private land, remote and beautiful. Yeah, I always like to come out here. Virgil has been coming here since he was a kid, and this part of Kansas has always been home. Well, this is the only place I've ever been. I just don't know if there's better places or not. Well, while travel hasn't been part of his life, a tiny piece of paradise is this little waterfall in the middle of a Kansas river. Hot outside as far as cool in here. 
a waterfall hidden except to those like Virgil who know the gifts of the Kansas River. Well, Virgil passed away two years later in 2010. He was 93 years old, but just hearing those old stories as only Virgil mm -hmm. could tell them, it keeps them alive and it keeps the history alive. And I'm so glad uh, you have those stories to keep them alive. The other thing I noticed about several of your stories, they're about very, very simple people, mm -hmm. but with profound advice about what life is all about. Mm -hmm. And in their simplicity, we realize, yeah, that's what life is all about. That's right. And all we have to do is open our ears and listen. And listen. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Well, that was another batch of gems, Larry. Oh, thank you, Susie. <laughs> thank you for sharing all those with us once again. Well, I appreciate that. Atterberg's people at kpts.org is our email address if you have a question or a comment. And we always love hearing from you. We're out of time for now. Until next time, I'm Larry Hatterberg. I'm Susan Peters. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll join us again next time for more of Larry's classic stories. Take care.